This is Plain Spoken, and I'm Jeffrey Rickman. I'm a local licensed pastor in Oklahoma, and this is a Friday News Digest. I get some of these uh, from other organizations, and I think they're really helpful. Uh, I'm going to follow up on a couple reports that I have done. Uh, be looking for a follow-up uh, this next week on how central conferences cannot disaffiliate under paragraph 2553. Um, this is that's a deep dive. This is just going to be introduction to a number of smaller developments in the denomination over the last week or so. Um, some Facebook, Twitter drama, some uh, legal stuff, uh, churches filing suit against different conferences, uh, stuff that I think is interesting and pertinent to what's going on in the United Methodist Church. Uh, if this is your first plain spoken thing that you're watching, um, I'm a conservative. My whole thing here is just trying to make sense out of the current picture from a conservative standpoint. And then anyone who watches, I hope that I, I help you kind of come to terms with what's going on. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert, but I, I think I understand some of the different institutional things at play, the different dynamics and theological differences and practical things that come out of this. So if it's useful to you, send it to somebody else, promote it. If it's not useful to you, then God bless you, go on your merry way. Um, but I, I uh, wanted to start off, let's see, with a tweet from Tom Lambrecht, uh, who's of course associated with Good News Magazine, and he is uh, noting, uh, I've seen this all over Facebook and Twitter, this is just a sample tweet, there is apparently a revival going on at Asbury college and seminary. They have a, a chapel there that in 1970 they had a huge uh, week-long revival. I actually think it was longer than a week. It's been a while since I read up on this. My brother went to seminary at Asbury. They have an undergraduate and uh, a seminary there and then they have a, a chapel, a regular chapel service where um, apparently they started worshiping the other day and they couldn't stop and they've been going and going. I've seen a lot of different videos on this um, it's, uh, it looks very interesting and emotional. I grew up in a, a tradition where, uh, I can honestly say I've only ever been to one revival. It was a scheduled revival and it was here in the Oklahoma countryside. It wasn't like this. This, um, this is being purported to be a movement of the Holy Spirit in which it was not planned, in which, uh, the people are just so filled with who the Holy Spirit is, what he's doing that they are led to just continue worshiping, praising, praying. There are photos of people praying over one another at the front. Um, you know, people are coming and going as they are able. Professors have uh, canceled classes, and the whole school is just uh, really dwelling on the Lord and, and, and what he's doing. Now, this, this comes after decades of resentment against Asbury Seminary. There are, of course, 13 official United Methodist seminaries that receive funding from the denomination, rising in influence uh, within uh, all of uh, Methodism, Wesleyanism, and there are many boards of ordained ministry across the connection that have intentionally, actively said, we are not going to work with them. We don't like them. We don't like the kind of evangelical clergy that they produce. And so this is something that is kind of galling, I think, to uh, a lot of um, left-leaning Methodists who want to believe that the Holy Spirit is not active in uh, the evangelical movement. Uh, provided that this is genuine, I think it'd be pretty hard to, to fake this. Um, it's worth considering uh, where the Holy Spirit is leading and, and what he's doing in this time. So that was the first thing I knew we needed to talk about. Uh, the second thing that uh, I just thought was interesting, John Lomparis has recently caught some flack. He is, uh, of course, associated with the IRD. Uh, he and Mark Tooley work on different wings of the same bird in a lot of ways. Um, Lomparis has been engaging uh, the information that gets disseminated within the United Methodist Church. There are, of course... Uh, things put out by UM News, generally other than commentaries, are in favor of the institution. The, the stuff generated by each annual conference, of course, is going to be in favor of be UMC, stay UMC. I don't know if you've seen those hashtags. Um, they're, they're not inclined to look at the ways in which uh, the denomination has had problematic leadership or uh, hasn't always used 
money very faithfully from the offering plate or hasn't always advocated in congruence with the general conference. These are things that people like Mr. Lon Paris have substantiated over the course of uh, decades. Lon Paris himself, I think, has been doing this uh, for under 10 years, but there's a long line of people who've had uh, some real issues with the denomination going back, and that's why they've advocated for evangelical renewal, change, um, figuring out the the protocol for peaceful separation and all that. Lon Paris in, in this uh, uh, post uh, cites a different pastor who talks about, he says that there is no um, expiration of disaffiliation. Um, that paragraph 2553, even though, yes, technically it ends at the end of the year, uh, there's still going to be a way to disaffiliate for churches that are unhappy. And so Lon Paris engages that and he says, that's misinformation. Um, if you have followed this particular issue, you know that paragraph 2548.2 was uh, another provision that would allow local churches to exit. Well, when we um, passed 2553 Three. at the General Conference 2019, the Judicial Council, our Supreme Court, announced, okay, the old provision is now canceled because we can only have one for one reason. I, I never understood this argument. Um, so anyway, in this particular situation, uh, even though Lon Paris pushes back, Brian Butcher, who is apparently a, a leader in the centrist movement and has been on uh, the general conference level for some time, curses at him and then says that uh, there, there might be a way out after all. So, uh, you know, it's wrong for us to say that, that churches are going to be trapped if they don't get out now. Um, maybe a general conference 2024, uh, technically General Conference 2020. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then uh, watch my reporting that gets released here soon. Anyway, um, they could approve a new disaffiliation method. Um, and hypothetically, that's that's totally true. Um, there are a lot of hypotheticals that are possible. The question is, how much will is there to approve such legislation? Are, is there going to be a will of the majority to promote a new disaffiliation agreement for churches that are not wanting to be a part of uh, the UMC. Well, a lot of people look at the current situation and go, um, the sentiment across the connection does not seem to be sympathetic with churches that want to disaffiliate. When you have uh, more than a dozen conferences that have made it pretty much impossible to exit, when you're looking at conferences like West Virginia, which I reported on last week, which don't even have a disaffiliation uh, agreement in place, then you're looking at a situation where um, it's hard to imagine that there's going to be much eagerness to promote a new disaffiliation plan for unwilling churches. So um, continuing on with this uh, drama around Lon Paris, Bishop Trimble, oops, I'm not clicking the right place. Bishop Trimble picked a fight with him. He put out this uh, statement, the state of the church here. Um, which I, I watched, and he was very jolly all the way through, except for when he starts digging on um, Lon Paris. He says that Lon Paris is uh, a disseminator of misinformation. Now, it's real easy to say things like that, but I'm not sure it's true. And here's the thing. I've read a lot of John Lon Paris over the years, and I found him to be pretty gracious. I think he's genuinely concerned about the majority world church, i.e. non-white people. Uh, he's taken special efforts to consider the African and Asian voices in our connection and in the world. He has a, a pretty good mind for legal stuff. Whenever he's done commentary on the Judicial Council, he, he cites his sources, he backs up what he says, and he, in his analysis, always seems pretty fair. So it seemed like a, an odd move to me that Bishop Trimble would pick a fight with him because I, I think all you have to do is read Lon Paris's writing, um, and I've reached out to him for an interview. I want to see his his uh, uh, feedback, hear his feedback on Bishop Trimble and others taking issue with him as a source of misinformation. If anybody knows of anything that he has claimed that is just not true, that's a flat-out lie, then I want to know about it. I'd like to hold his feet to the fire. I don't think we can have right-leaning voices that are avidly spreading false information. However, if he's just engaging in conjecture and you think that he's engaging in um, <clears throat> scenarios that you just don't think are, 
are realistic. Well, listen, that's what a grown-up conversation looks like. You know, this is what critical thinking looks like. We entertain different voices that come at issues from different angles, and we have to discern the truth out of that. What what he's doing, I mean, if he's a bad faith actor, then yeah, let's expose that. But I've been reading Lon Paris for years, and I, I, I see a lot of consistency and character there. So I would like to see what you see, Bishop Trimble, if... Um, if he is indeed a bad actor. All right, let's let's uh, let's move on to the next one. We've got, uh, oh yes, the Wesleyan Coven Association in North Georgia. You'll remember North Georgia, I did a report on this, I don't know, three weeks ago, uh, under their uh, previous bishop, Sue Halpert Johnson, just said there's too much misinformation out there. We cannot uh, continue to allow for churches to be disaffiliating whenever there's just not much good information out there for them. So for the rest of the year, no more disaffiliations. And it just so happens that at the end of the year, paragraph 2553 expires and there is no currently formulated way for local churches to exit. So North Georgia Conference churches understandably cried foul. And uh, here's an update from them. As the week draws to a close, we have a few updates to share with you. Okay, so this is today, February 10th, when they posted this, I'm pretty sure. Um, Yes, definitely, it was an hour ago. Um, There are hundreds of folks in North Georgia fasting and praying for a breakthrough, and if you'd like to join us, go to this link. Our team has done everything in our power to avoid the need for litigation. We have made efforts to work with the conference leadership to get our 2553 process back on track up to this point. Conference leaders have not relented. Now, they've gotten a new bishop who hypothetically could have changed the course, uh, but she's chosen not to. Meanwhile, more than 130 churches in North Georgia have joined the NCLL and are now being legally represented as we simultaneously prepare for litigation and discuss with conference leaders what it will take to get our process back on track. This group includes large, medium, and small churches, County seat churches, first churches, city churches, urban churches, suburban churches, and rural churches. It is clear that many of our conference in our conference are ready to get back on track. The list of participating churches will not be made public until the appropriate time, but feel free to ask your pastor or council chair if you have questions about your own church. Is there still time to join? Yes. Um, A lot of it from that point on is um, kind of nuts and bolts of it. So the NCLL is the National Center for Life and Liberty. I looked into them whenever um, a lot of this stuff started falling apart. They are a, a nonprofit based out of Florida. Um, a lot of people have heard of them and don't know it. They were the ones who handled the Terry Schiavo case uh, more than a decade ago when um, people were trying to end the life of a woman named Terry Schiavo. Uh, they, they pick up cases that are uh, religiously oriented and they, they advocate for religious freedom. So um, they have already been active in Florida and in North Carolina. They have uh, pending lawsuits and many annual conferences. I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot more. Um, but the model that they use, they don't do a class action lawsuit, um, which is... Uh, pretty common when you're talking about multiple agreed parties. Rather, they go to an annual conference and they find all of the churches that are willing to file suit against the conference, and then they file against the conference as many suits as there are churches that are willing to file, and then they prosecute each case. So in this case, if there are 130 churches, they are going to file 130 lawsuits against the annual conference. And so the sheer number of cases, the amount of money and uh, uh, manpower required to do battle against the NCLL is uh, ideally, in in their strategy, going to overwhelm conferences. Now, part of the reality here is that uh, many conferences, as we found in, say, Texas, where Ryan Barnett uh, did a lot of the heavy lifting doing a lot of research on conference finances. A lot of annual conferences have conference reserves going back more than 100 years where people leave endowments and trusts, uh, wills to the annual conference. And those uh, funds, depending on the conference, are generally not reported at all. And so a lot of these annual conferences are sitting on massive amounts of money that they can throw at lawsuits if, if, if it's worth it to them. So. We don't know how much 
they have in reserves, how effectively they can do battle against the NCLL. And then you don't really know how things are going to go. From state to state, um, there are different uh, postures that the state takes in relation to ecclesial authorities. So in Oklahoma, where I'm at, generally um, the state defers to the ecclesiastical authority. So um, Oklahoma churches are not necessarily in a good position to file with the NCLL. Um, and, and they might argue about that. Um, in Texas, on the other hand, they're much more for the freedom of the local church. So um, there are churches that have straight up withdrawn and left without even using the provision of 2553, and it remains to be seen if uh, they can be corrected or not. So the NCLL, um, let's see, let's look at their website, and of course I did the wrong thing again. Um, it's at nCLL.org and um, they just require a, a th one uh, an annual one thousand dollar donation where they will represent you and of course they are about a lot more than just this United Methodist drama they uh, they can just do um, well say there are a lot of churches that are disaffiliating right now and they don't want to necessarily join up with another denomination anytime soon. And so they need to establish themselves as an independent 501c3, and <clears throat> the NCLL can help with all that paperwork. Um, my church was needing to entertain a, uh, or not entertain, create a new um, um, facility use policy. They had documents on file that we could use. So they're, they're a great resource to have, even if you have no intentions of filing suit against the United Methodist Church. It's just a good thing to know about. They, they want to resource the local church. Um, you know, some people might portray them as being kind of skeezy or opportunistic. Uh, that's that's kind of the name of the game whenever you're a lawyer. Uh, the Christian Post did an article, Attorney Defense Church is Suing the United Methodist Church Over Disaffiliation Process. Um, in which it kind of just walks through uh, briefly the ethics of such a thing. Of course, in uh, some other reporting I've done, I've turned to 1 Corinthians where um, Paul talks about how embarrassing it is whenever Christians file suit against one another. And I've gotten pushed back on that from both uh, liberals and conservatives on that. Um, but if you've already made up your mind that uh, there is no other way to go, then, uh, you know, the NCLL is an option. The only other option I'm aware of is uh, Dan Dalton with Dalton and Tomich um, uh, law firm and he does YouTube videos talking about um, different dynamics in the state of the United Methodist Church which I generally find helpful but I think some of his stronger statements have proven to not be as firm as uh, he has made them sound. So uh, let's go on to the next topic. Uh, Commentary by Lonnie Brooks. I think that's what uh, it was. Um, no, I just had a conference map that I thought would be helpful to have. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't want to do that anymore. Um, Lonnie Brooks, long-term centrist progressive. No, he's a centrist, not a progressive. He wrote this uh, uh, article that was published through UM News. It's a commentary. The, the key points he makes, the United Methodist centrists and progressives have made common cause in working for the inclusion of LGBTQ people in church life. I'm not sure that, I, I think I would say they've made common cause in ostracizing conservatives from the denomination. I'm not sure, I think there's still centrists who are um, on the fence about how, how wise it would be to f include LGBTQ persons in every aspect of the life of the church, but I the rest of the article points in that. Lonnie D. Brooks, a, a veteran general conference delegate, expects the coalition to be short-lived. He predicts differences will arise between centrists and progressives and how they approach ministry with the poor. He actually predicts uh, tension in more places than care of the poor, but that is one area. And um, he, you know, he's been on the scene for a long time. He's an intelligent guy. Very few people can test um, if he knows the denomination at all, he just they just disagree with his overall analysis. But he does this helpful thing at the bottom of his, his article where he lines out six ways in which centrists and progressives are very different. And a, a thing he returns to over and over, I'm not going to read each one individually because I'm trying to make this brief. The thing he returns to over and over is that um, centrists um, 
are not inclined to use law overt authoritarian top-down strategies for getting people to comply, whereas progressives are, not just within the church, but also within the state. They're very much in favor of petitioning government to do things that conservatives would say are strictly within uh, the ages of the church and not the state. Um, they're much more concerned with power and uh, top-down power specifically. And uh, Brooks says that centrists are fundamentally different, that they are more grassroots and dialogical um, in nature, and that this will pit progressives and centrists against one another, especially as uh, centrists are not on board with a, a lot of the further left-leaning kind of extreme behaviors. I was talking with a, uh, a centrist pastor here in Oklahoma one time, and he called them the loony left um, how tolerant is the loony left going to be of centrists? And a lot of the pushback I've seen is, uh, you know, there are a lot more centrists than there are of far left progressives. Um, this is not a threat. Well, the thing is, there are more conservatives <laughs> than uh, 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 far left progressives, and yet they have effectively been able to ostracize us from the conversation. So it's not really a numbers game. It's a uh, in my opinion, it's about the level of hysteria and volume and anger that one can reach consistently and how consistently people can fight for power over others. Um, and of course, they would have a caricature of uh, conservatives as being hysterical and, and power hungry, and uh, conservatives would just say that's projection. So anyway, it remains to be seen if Lonnie Brooks is, is right on that. But it is interesting that even at this moment of victory, where uh, conservatives are trying to get out. There's an exodus, and, and they're losing strength by the day in the United Methodist Church. Already centrists are foreseeing that uh, there are hard times coming. All right, and then the, the final thing I wanted to talk about... I keep doing that. final thing I want to talk about is uh, paragraph 722 in the Book of Discipline. It's in uh, the 2016 Book of Discipline, but uh, it, it, it also got passed along after the 2019 session. This is something I'm not sure many people know about. It's uh, restrictions on closed meetings. Uh, let me read the text of this to you, and you'll see why I care in a minute. In the spirit of openness and accountability, all meetings of councils, boards, agencies, commissions, and committees of the church at all levels of the church, including subunit meetings and teleconferences, shall be open. Regardless of local laws or customs, all participants shall be notified at the beginning of any meeting, including telephone or video conference calls, if the meeting is being recorded electronically and the intended use of such recording. Portions of a meeting may be closed for consideration of specific subjects if such a closed session is authorized by an affirmative public vote of at least three-fourths of the voting members present. The vote shall be taken in public session and recorded in the minutes. Documents distributed in open meetings shall be considered public. Great restraint should be used in closing meetings. Closed sessions should be used as seldom as possible. Subjects that may be considered in closed session are limited to real estate matters, negotiations, when general knowledge could be harmful to the negotiation process, personal matters, etc., etc. And then it says at the end that um, General Conference and Judicial Council and the Council of Bishops will live by the spirit of this paragraph. Each of these constitutional bodies is governed by its own rules and procedures. So why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because there's it's a time of great mistrust in our denomination, and there's a lot of concern that uh, people holding the levers of power at the general church level or even at the annual conference church level are um, saying and doing things behind closed doors that are not not in the interest of local churches but are also not ethical. And the only way to combat such suspicion is to have transparency. The problem is in a lot of places, a lot of conferences, a lot of uh, committees are not at all inclined to allow people outside of the committee to uh, be present to witness what's going on, and they're not inclined to share uh, their meeting minutes. Now, specifically uh, of concern in every annual conference would be the Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees is the primary body responsible for drafting disaffiliation agreements and the conditions on which um, local churches can exit. Um, many of those conversations are taking place that are not at all sympathetic 
to conservative evangelical voices. The dynamic that's been at play in lots of annual conferences is um, at a jurisdictional conference, they passed resolutions saying that if uh, conservative leaders are planning on leaving the denomination, they should just go ahead and get off every boarding committee that they're on. They should not be affecting the future of their their bodies that they're currently in. A lot of uh, conservative churches and representatives have already disaffiliated, and they've withdrawn from those boards and agencies. And so they've been replaced with centrists and liberals that are going to stay, and they're not looking at conservative representation. So um, conservatives are mostly focused on running out the door as fast as they can because they see that things are getting more hostile by the day. But I think it would be wise for conservative caucus groups, especially the WCA, to be looking at paragraph 70, 722 and consistently petitioning different conference boards and agencies for uh, notes about what they're covering in their meetings, as well as um, times and dates of their meetings and permission to be present, even if they're not uh, participating, just as witnesses so that they can know what's going on. Um, to my knowledge, I haven't heard of anybody using this to press for uh, continued um, updating and knowledge on what's going on. Uh, so far, what's going on in lots of conferences is evangelicals being locked out of those centers of power and then just getting the downstream effects whenever uh, they're finally ready to be announced. And that's, that's, I mean, the whole point of this paragraph 722 is so that that doesn't have to happen, so that everything can be above ground, everything can be beyond suspicion. And I, I've seen personally a lot of conference officials taking great offense at being asked to be transparent, uh, kind of saying, well, don't you trust me? Uh, you should trust me. And I, uh, I, I don't think that's a realistic way to be in relationship with one another. I think um, we should be eager to, to show people that they can trust us and be, be open with others. I try and model that in my own pastoral ministry and in the way that, I mean, that's what this show is. It's, it's, it's just openly saying what a lot of people say behind closed doors because they feel threatened. They feel like it's a hostile, uh, corrupt environment. And I'm going to show, this is how I show trust. I, I speak the truth in love, hoping that other people will hear it and be moved to be conscientious and fair in their conduct rather than being tribal and partisan and hateful. I, we can't keep going down this road, folks. Uh, we can't keep uh, speaking ill of each other and slandering one another and dividing along party lines. We have to be able to discern who are the people interested in truth that I, I can be in dialogue with, and then who are the people, you know, I really hate it if somebody listens to this whole thing and goes, man, this guy is just um, a talking head. He's just, he's just an ideologue. He can't understand uh, people on the other side. I'm really trying to understand people on the other side, while also understanding the dynamics that affect people uh, that I sympathize with. So I wanted to end with an exhortation today. Uh, to conservatives, and that is, I think we would all be better off if we were more public about what's going on. Uh, not slandering public officials, not speaking ill of anybody, but talking about the dynamics in our local churches, talking about who is uh, disaffiliating or having the, the conversations involved, talking about when the conference is pushing back and, and claiming misinformation, um, talking about other documents um, circulated around, um, have you circulated your conference's disaffiliation agreement? Have you circulated among your own conference um, the, the way that your conference is doing the math on how much you're going to have to pay um, to disaffiliate? There are a lot of particulars involved in this stuff where the conference uh, and powers that be are counting on you being secret and not sharing this stuff. It, it really is best, you know, to, to use a metaphor, in the workplace, we're always bemoaning that some people are paid uh, more than others, and that's unfair. Well, how do you know that that's going on? A lot of times you don't, because people don't talk about their salary. Uh, we have these kind of American prudish fiscal values that don't make much sense to me. I think especially when money's concerned, but also power. Uh, we should be circulating information about who is hearing what, who said what, um, so that we can discern fact from fiction, fairness from um, injustice. The only way that's going to happen is when we openly and honestly share information 
And then, um, you know, also what rises to the surface then is when we discern people that are consistently not spreading good information, and that's when we can shut that down. God help us. Conservatives cannot be associated with false information. We have to be vigilant for the truth. Uh, we have to be earnest in our de desire to, to seek and make meaning with all good faith conversation partners. And there is no ifs, ands, or buts around this. If we serve Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, then we have to have a passion for truth, even if it doesn't suit our agenda, even if it doesn't suit our interests. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue uh, trying to make sense of all this stuff. I, uh, I wanted to have a little more follow-up on some reports I've done in the past, but I'll do that at a later time. I, I, I wanted to keep this short, so I'm going to end it. Uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. Hope you have a good weekend. Go praise the Lord with the community of saints this Sunday, and uh, I'll see you next week.